So let's welcome Kyle and Ariel Ashley. Yeah. Log in into Hugger right now. Absolutely. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Dan, and uh, thank everyone for being here today. Um, my name is Kyle Ashley. And I'm Ariel. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit today about um, vital practice and how to have healthy relationships towards simple living. Um, and actually, um, we had it, it was a great introduction from from Joshua. Thank you so much for those words. And I think um, what you shared, a lot of what you shared. It's really going to connect well with the message that we have today. And, um, and you'll find, I think, um, we're very interactive. Um, so we were talking with some folks beforehand about, you know, like, what is it going to be like? And can we expect to answer some questions? Um, we're actually probably going to have you all talking more than we're going to talk. Um, so again, we're, we're excited to be here, and we're excited to hear some of those stories that, that Joshua was talking about. So um, just to get us started, you know, since, since we're going to be spending some time together today, and we're going to be talking about stories, we thought it would be important for us to share our story with you all. Um, so again, my name is Kyle, and I'm originally from a small town in, in uh, rural Michigan. Um, and normally when we do speaking engagements and when we talk, we talk a lot about identity and we talk a lot about diversity. Um, so we're diversity trainers, inclusion consultants, um, and we think that those things are really important in terms of healthy relationships. Um, and today we're going to talk a little bit about the identity stuff, but we're going to focus mainly on the healthy relationships. So my story starts with a failure. Um, it's about four years ago, and I'm in a hotel conference room with about 50 other people. Um, and I'm at a week-long social justice training institute. And for the past four days of this training institute, this evenly split group of about half people of color and half white people have talked about nothing but race for the whole time. Now. Growing up in an all-white family in rural Michigan, race was not something that, that I was sort of raised to talk about very often, right? Um, and honestly, you know, because everybody else around me kind of looked like me, they, we were all white, there was really no reason to talk about race. Um, so I originally signed up for the conference because I had some mentors who sort of said, this is going to be a really good opportunity to learn and grow. You should really check it out. Well, those mentors didn't say anything about how terrifying the experience was going to be. <laughs> right. So I woke up every morning, walked down to that conference room, and had the biggest knot in my stomach. You know, being one of the only straight white men in the group, I sort of felt like I was going to be under the microscope a little bit. I was worried that anything that I might say or do during the conference would be sort of construed or perceived as being racist in some way. And so it was especially terrifying on that last day of the conference where I'm standing in this big conference room. The whole group is in a circle. And all of the, the white folks in the room are, are asked to voluntarily step forward and share a time when they have either said or done something racist. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, so this is the thing that I was trying to avoid the whole time. Yeah. Um, so as bravely stepped forward and shared their stories. Um, you know, that knot in my stomach grew a little bit tighter and my hands sweat a little bit more. And in the end, I, I didn't share. I, I didn't participate. Um, my fear sort of got the best of me. And, and I failed myself. And I kind of failed everybody else in the group. Um, and the more I talked to folks afterwards who did share, um, you know, the more I realized that you know, instead of trying to sort of quiet myself and look like the good ally or the good white person in the group by, by not admitting that I had done anything wrong. Um, it's actually more important to actually be a good ally and sort of talk about some of those weaknesses and talk about some of those things that you can improve in. Um, and so that's sort of when I realized that just showing up, just being in the room is not enough. It's not enough to just be there. You have to be vulnerable. You have to put yourself out there. You have to be willing to admit that you have room to grow. Um, and that was what I learned at that conference. And so ever since then, I've been on a, <clears throat> a journey to be more vulnerable, to share my story more, um, and to create brave spaces for bold conversations. So when I think about a story and I think about relationships, um, I think about my family. And I think about the fact that for most of my life, I have felt like an other or an outsider in my family. 
so I remember um, one particular weekend, I was about eight years old, and there was a Lemire family reunion up north in Minnesota, very typical Minnesota fish fry, everyone's together, there's like 40 <laughs> or 50 different people on the circle, people I swear I've never met before, but we're like hugging because we're supposed to be family. Um, and you know, everyone comes together for a family picture to document you know, this Lemire family gathering. And I remember, as a small child, taking my mom's hand, bringing her aside, and saying, can I wear the family reunion t-shirt? Can I be in the picture? Because I'm a transracial adoptee, so I don't look like my family. The Lemires are French, and I'm not. Um, <laughs> but I'm a part of that family. Um, my insecurities uh, around being otherized, or about being different, only intensified throughout my adolescence. I remember in high school, as uncomfortable and problematic as this might sound, there were moments where I would look in the mirror and wish that I was white, because then I would look like my mother, instead of looking like a friend who was hanging out with my mother. Um, I had a mentor when I was in college who saw me trying to navigate these different aspects of my identity, and she really encouraged me to think about you know, not choosing being Asian or being white or connected to white culture, she really encouraged me to think about integrating the two. Um, and I think that was really meaningful. And actually, I made an intentional commitment at that point to try to do some personal reconciliation, to create that space that had never been given to me to really explore who I was so that I could better connect in relationship with other people. So I went to graduate school, I studied counseling, and I had a really profound and empowering experience. So what had at one point been my enoughness complex, never feeling Asian enough, or never feeling white enough, or Lemire enough, um, I was able to kind of harness that into a passion to explore my own identity, to encourage other people to think critically about who they are so that they can better form authentic relationships with other people. So if you haven't guessed yet, Kyle and I are consulting partners as well as life partners. Um, you know, exploring our own identities and journeying um, through kind of that intentional reflection uh, created a path for both of us serendipitously to, to work in higher education. Um, and actually in 2011, we met at an international higher education conference. Um, so you never know what can happen when you go to a conference. <laughs> <laughs> conference and we quickly discovered that we actually had a lot in common. Not only were we passionate about social justice, passionate about intentional reflection and identity exploration, but we also were both from the Midwest. We also, also both grew up in single parent families. We had strong female role models as the heads of our household. Um, and you know kind of I guess the rest is history. But um, we kind of joke now that it was really um, I don't know if it's ironic is the right word, but that it, it took you know, two Midwesterners 26 years and traveling across the Atlantic Ocean to be able to find kind of this companionship. We feel really blessed that we did. Yep. And so after spending a year uh, traveling, teaching, and doing some work together abroad, um, we got engaged at the end of that year and decided to come back to the States to plan our wedding and be a little bit closer to family. Um, we ended up landing jobs uh, over in New Hampshire at Dartmouth College, an, an Ivy League institution. Um, and after working for a couple of years there, um, creating some uh, award-winning innovative programs there, we, um, we decided to sort of step away from, from higher education and take a leap of faith and start our own uh, independent consulting company where we have these kinds of conversations with people all over the place. Um, and so uh, thus, Ashley Consulting was born. Um, and so getting back to our Midwestern roots, we decided to move from New Hampshire back here to the Twin Cities in Minnesota. And it's, it's been lovely. It's my first time living here. It's really quite a wonderful place. If you're in from out of town, welcome. We're, we're really glad to have you. We are nice here in, in Minnesota. And, that's <laughs> really um, and today we're really thrilled uh, to be here with you talking about simple living, healthy relationships, um, and going deeper in those relationships. All right, so enough about us. Let's talk about how do we foster healthy relationships towards simple living. Um, today we're going to really delve deeply, and we, we want to introduce this concept to you. We call it vital practice. It's a framework and a model that we use in all of our work, and we really believe that these kind of core concepts allow people to have some of those bold conversations, to create those brave spaces, to be able to connect authentically with others, create intentional, meaningful relationships, and as a result, have a happier and healthier life. Um, we want to, I guess, maybe clarify, we don't think relationships are simple. 
far from it, right? To have healthy relationships is actually it's challenging. It's a process. You got to work at it. Um, but we do think if you're able to cultivate healthy relationships, you will have a simpler life. Um, you can be more authentically and wholly yourself, congruent in different places with different relationships, um, and you can have deeper um, connections and, and more support. Um, so vital, this is kind of our, our main framework, stands for vulnerability, identity, trust, authorship, and liberation. We're gonna work through this model today in the next 50 minutes. Um, we're hoping that as a result of our time together this morning, um, we'll have a chance to offer this framework to you, to give you a space to kind of build some of your skills and, ter and capacity in terms of practicing um, the vital framework in your own life. And we'll, again, kind of to Joshua's point, start a conversation. And we really invite questions and thoughts, something we didn't mention earlier, but in light of social media, please feel free to tweet during the, the workshop if you have questions or thoughts. Um, we just ask that you use the hashtag vital practice so that we can follow it later um, and engage with you even after um, this time together. <laughs> Great. So we think the first step in developing healthy relationships and simplifying your life really requires you to be vulnerable. Um, intentionally building positive relationships with others um, can be challenging at times and it does require us to be brave and take risks. Um, and so we're going to start to explore um, this part of the process by thinking about the people who are most important to us in our lives. Um, and so we passed around some sheets of paper, so they're on the sort of end of, of the, um, the rows here. Um, we want you to take one sheet of paper um, and we want you to fold it vertically and horizontally so that there are nine boxes on the, the sheet of paper and Ariel will to demonstrate what that looks like. I did not ace art class, so this is not a competition, right? But just fold it into thirds. Yep, something like that. And then the other way, fold it into thirds. Like that. Ta da! Yes. All right. Does everyone have paper? Very artistic, very creative. Thank you very much, Ariel. Appreciate that. Happy. Yeah. So now, uh, once you've got your boxes folded, we're going to be using this paper throughout the rest of our presentation. So make sure you hold on to this. Um, and what we want you to do is, in the middle box, uh, we want you to write your name um, and write it towards the top of the box so that you have some room underneath. To write. <laughs> it's okay. Twelve boxes is, you know, the more the merrier. <laughs> Look at you. I did his first. That's right. Okay. So when you have your nine boxes and you've got your name in the middle, um, the next thing that we want you to do is we want you to think about. Uh, the people who have had the biggest impact, the most significant impact on you in your life. So we want you to pick eight people who have had the most significant impact on you in your life. Now this can be uh, people who have had a positive impact, this can be pe people who had a negative impact. Understanding that negative doesn't necessarily mean somebody that you hate, that you are like venomously opposed to, but somebody that maybe um, you have a tenuous relationship with, um, and that you know there are challenging moments. Um, but not somebody that you despise. So go ahead and pick eight people um, that have had a significant impact on you in your life and write those eight people in the boxes that surround your name. Can you see how these people you know personally are influences like an author or something? That's could be, a good point. Yeah, it could be anything. Anything that you want. So what we want you to do now is we want you to find a partner, somebody that you don't know. So I know a lot of people travel to together and, and know the folks that they're sitting next to. So go ahead and find a partner, somebody that you haven't met yet. Um, and we want you to talk about some of the folks on your list. Um, talk about who they are and why they've been significant in your life. You'll have maybe about five minutes uh, to chat with that person, make sure that both of you get a chance to talk. Um, you don't have to go through your whole list. Don't go through the whole list. Just take a couple. One or two people. Yep. So go ahead and find that person and have a, have a conversation. Thanks for sharing. We, we think that vulnerability is a really, really important part of building healthy relationships. In fact, we, we think it's probably one of the most important parts. Um, and the process that you just went through um, is, is essentially doing that. So um, not only identifying the people in your life who have been important to you, that's vulnerable in some ways, right? Because not only do you have, have to identify who those people were, which is hard to miss, right? <laughs> But you also have to think about what the impact was that they had on your life. And sometimes, whether it's good or bad, that can be like kind of vulnerable in some ways, right? 
Uh, but then also, the process that you went through in terms of sharing with somebody that you didn't know what, that, what those people did and, and who those people were in your life, uh, that's vulnerable too. So um, you actually just practice the first step in healthy relationships with, with vulnerability. So um, we're going to move on into the, the next step. So the I in vital is about identity. And so this kind of takes us to thinking about um, how who we are affects the relationships with the people that have um, made an impact on our lives. So um, simply put, if we don't know who we are, it's really hard to make connections with other people. Similarly, if we don't know about other people, their stories, to Joshua's point, where they're coming from, what values they have, it's also hard to kind of build those authentic relationships. So we want to give you all some time to think about your identity and then also about themes that you might see across identity between yourself and the people who are important in shaping your life. Um, so individually, on your sociogram, under, in the middle square, underneath your name, we'd love for you to go ahead and write how you show up in these social identity categories. Now this will be private, you won't have to show that, sh share this with your partner, um, but again, it's an exercise in thinking about who we are. Now recognize, of course, um, I am not limited to a box, and neither are all of you. So this is just a starting point, right? These are kind of what we call the D7+, plus, the basic kind of core elements of identity when we think about forming um, connections with other people across difference. Um, so again, uh, for me, right, my name is Ariel. Um, under gender, I would write cisgendered woman. Under religion, I would write Christian, journeying and trying to figure what the, out what that means to me. Um, under age, young professional is very salient for me. Um, so again, <laughs> go ahead and take a couple minutes on your own to write how you show up. Um, in these different categories. Um, and then what we're gonna ask is for you to turn to that partner that you were just speaking with. And again, you don't have to share your identities necessarily, but to, to process with how your identities compare, contrast, overlap with some of the identities that you know of the people that you've written on your sociogram. So for instance. Yeah, I'll, I'll share a couple examples. So um, for example, Ariel and I. Obviously, Ariel is somebody who has had a significant impact on my life. Okay. Um, yes, yes. Um, and uh, we identify differently in terms of our spirituality. So Ariel strongly identifies as a Christian. I strongly identify as spiritual, journeying, not sure. Um, I, I studied philosophy in college, and so I'm always thinking about spirituality and bigger questions, but I haven't landed in any particular religion. And so that conversation comes up all the time for us. You know, when we talk about raising our kids, you know, how, how are we going to handle it? Are we going to go to church? Are we not going to go to church? Um, so that conversation comes up all the time for us. Um, in terms of somebody that I have a, a similarity with around identity, one, one of my best friends from college, his name's Matt, he was uh, my best man at my wedding. Um, obviously, we're, we're both guys, and we strongly identify as um, sort of uh, guys who have been raised by single mothers. So we were, we were both raised by single mothers. Our parents divorced early. Um, and, and that identity of masculinity, that part of, of manhood for us, is really salient to the way that we relate with each other, right? Um, so we're not big into like football and like, you know, really like violent sports and all that stuff. Like we're more into like talking about books and uh, you know, that's sort of how we express our, our relationship with each other and our masculinity with each other. So those are just a couple examples, um, but I'm sure all of you will have your own unique ways of doing it. So go ahead and think about your identities and then how they relate to, to the folks around you and then turn to the person that you've been talking with and, and share some of that. What do you mean by social class? Social class, social class is, is sort of how, how, how you identify you in terms of um, like, like working class or middle class or upper, upper middle class. That's generally the, the labels that people use, but everybody has a, a different way of identifying that way. A lot of people will think of like socioeconomic status and income. I think social class is a little bit more broader, right? So it's thinking about educational attainment in addition to annual household income, in addition to how many people live in the house that you live in. So kind of different layers. But, yeah. Thank you. Of course. Any other questions? Ability? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, for me, when I think about ability, I'm thinking about that in terms of um, understanding what I have to bring to a table in terms of my physical, learning, cognitive, mental abilities and or different abilities. Um, so I often say, uh, you know, right now I present and experience being tempor temporarily able to so right now, I um, have full functioning of my, my physical but full, full body. Um, uh, and then kind of thinking about whether there are any cognitive or learning disabilities that impact how you walk through the world. Um, you know, those would be other places to kind of to go. It, for us, identity is so important in terms of building relationships. 
um, you know, if you're if we're not conscious of who we are and and taking into consideration who the other person across the table is, um, there's a lot that we're missing out on in terms of um, you know both where that person comes from, their story, and their strengths. Right? There's so much in in those stories and so much in in who we are in, in these aspects of our lives and all the others. Um, and so whether it's bonding with somebody. Um, over similarities that we share around identity, or whether it's uh, creating a relationship with somebody because of differences that we have. This stuff is really important um, in developing healthy relationships, and, uh, and we think it's really important to keep that stuff in mind as, as you're working towards healthier relationships. Um, and being vulnerable and talking about this stuff, you know, going back to the, the first part of what we talked about, you know, this stuff can be uncomfortable, it can be a little scary to share a little bit about ourselves, but again, we think that that piece is really, really important in building health, healthy relationships. So uh, the next part for us is talking about trust. Now trust is something that uh, we hear a lot. You know, it's really important in relationships. You have to have trust. Um, and so we're going to kind of engage in a little activity to sort of let us feel what trust feels like and maybe why it's not as easy as just you know, how, how it comes up in conversation. So um, we want you to find a partner that's different from the partner that you've been talking to. We'll call the partner that you're, you're with now your high five buddy. So go ahead and give your high five buddy a high five. Yeah. So they'll be your high five buddy for the rest of the conference. So every time you see them in the halls of St. Paul, what's up, high five buddy? High five buddy. Um, so we want you to find a, a partner who's different from your high five buddy. Um, and we want you to have a small, brief conversation with that person, just one minute, um, about what you had for dinner last night. So be very, very detailed in that conversation. Um, we want you to, to share the, the sights, the smells, the sounds, everything. Be as specific as you can. How did you feel about that meal? Everything. Uh, be as specific as you can. Take one minute, um, and then we'll let you know when it's time to switch. So go ahead, find a new partner, and talk about what you had to dinner last night. We're going to have a different topic of conversation this time, so it's okay. So this time, what we want you to talk about is we want you to talk about a time when you felt deeply ashamed of yourself. So think about a time you felt deeply ashamed of yourself. We're going to talk about that for one minute. Be as specific as possible. Talk about the sights, the sounds, the emotions that you felt. Talk about all of that. So go ahead. Um, you know, whoever was talking last, you can switch. And if you, you know, already did that, that's fine. But talk about a time when you felt deeply ashamed of yourself um, and, and what that felt like. Go ahead. <laughs> before you go ahead and share those <laughs> But the exercise is to get you to feel that whoosh, the discomfort, to demonstrate something, right? We want to demonstrate that being able to build a close relationship with someone requ requires trust. And that the idea of being vulnerable, going back to the being vital, it's important. But it takes a foundation, right? You can't just, hey, I'm Ariel, let me tell you my deepest, darkest secrets. Like, this is not how it authentically works, right? It makes the other person, the listener, really uncomfortable. It's terrifying for us. Um, so the trust for us is really about trusting the process and recognizing that sometimes when we have an opportunity to be vulnerable, the floor goes out from underneath us, and it feels terrifying. But if you recognize that you've started to build rapport with that person, Taking that leap of faith, sharing a little bit, not like flash flood, here's my whole life story, saga, everything, right? Like, you know, use your discretion in sharing kind of appropriately, but choosing to be vulnerable as appropriate can really deepen and strengthen the connection. So it probably doesn't make the most sense to walk up to people and say like, hi, I'm Ariel, let me tell you what I, you know, um, did last night with my sexual partner. Like, that's probably <laughs> not appropriate. But as you get to know and cultivate a relationship with someone, to be able to share, wow, I had this experience or this conversation where I was trying to tell my family what my passion was for simple living, and it was really uncomfortable. And actually, they didn't understand it, and they challenged me in it. To be able to share some of those vulnerabilities as appropriate, that can help us develop a network of support that can lead to healthy relationships, that can help us be more successful in, in leading simple lives. 
So thank you for engaging in that stomach drop. Um, and you know, uh, you can go ahead and have a seat. I, I practice yoga. I'm not a yogi, but I practice yoga. And so if you all will indulge me for a second, can we all take a really deep inhale and push out the, all the energy, the nervousness, the discomfort. Again, a deep inhale and then let it all go, all of that tension. All right, so we're going to keep it moving with vital practice. Um, and think about authorship, which is the A, uh, the element of thinking about how do we intentionally define and author what healthy relationships mean? How do we not just stumble into them, but intentionally create them and foster them? So you know, as we think about the life that we live in, the world is fickle, um, and it's super busy and prescribed, right? We're supposed to follow this script, there's this nine to five you know, rat race, um, we're supposed to have lots of credit card debt, and we're all here because we have chosen to live intentionally and not just follow that script, right? Um, so why don't we also do that with our relationships? Instead of assuming like, oh, I'm gonna go to this bar and meet someone and have a conversation, or oh, if I go to this meetup group and we all play kickball together, then we're gonna be best friends forever. Instead of just following kind of these pre-prescribed options, what if we were to take time to intentionally author what it meant for us to have healthy relationships with others? And so what we want you to do is to take out your sociogram again, this worksheet of the eight people who are important um, in shaping your life, and for the people who have made a positive impact in your life, those people who have really strengthened you and supported you in some way, we want you to take just a, a minute or two on your own to write down some of the characteristics that have made this person so important to you. And I'm gonna ask, to, is anyone comfortable sharing one or two of the characteristics they've written down? Feel free to just offer it up. Um, you don't have to say who it's about, but what, has, what are some characteristics of healthy relationships that you value in your lives? Yeah, please. Empathy. Empathy. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Hardworking. Hardworking. Generosity. Generosity. Selfless. Selfless. Consistency. Consistency. Sense of humor. Supportive. Supportive. Honesty. Honesty. Non-judgmental. Non-judgmental. Oh, silly. <clears throat> silly. Yeah. Fun. Inspirational. Inspirational. Encouraging you to be the best you. Encouraging you to be the best you. Autonomy. Autonomy. So I don't think that's my character. <laughs> Sorry, love. I tried. <laughs> I got some of them. <laughs> but this exercise, this list, the list that you've started, this is the first step in intentionally authoring positive and healthy relationships in your life. And this is really important, right? When we think of defining expectations, making lists, this is something we do a lot in our lives, right? Your job description, this is what's expected of you. This is kind of your parameters. This is what your colleagues and supervisors are gonna be looking for and, and expecting from you. Similarly, even going to the grocery store, we make lists of things that we want and need. Why don't we make lists of things we want and need in relationships? So this is the start of that, and we hope that you'll continue to revisit it and be intentional in authoring the relationships that you have in your life. Who are you inviting? What do you need? And how can you then go out um, and find it? Great. So we're at the end of Vital, and we've, we've covered a ton of ground today. Um, and for us, where, where Vital and healthy relationships culminates is this idea of liberation. Um, and for us, liberation means, you know, similarly to the principles of Simple Rev, where we're freeing ourselves from some of these prescriptions of society and the ways that society tells us that we're supposed to live. Liberation is sort of freeing ourselves um, from the relationships that um, sort of bind us in some ways and keep us bogged down. Um, and also liberating us towards those healthy relationships. Um, and so we really think a, a part of that process is healing. It's healing the relationships that have been challenging for us. Um, and then also continuing to heal the relationships that are positive in our lives. So whether it's finding closure with somebody that we've had a tentious or, or challenging relationship with, or whether it's expressing gratitude to somebody that has really made an amazingly positive impact on our lives. Um, both of those conversations and both of those processes are really healing um, towards developing more uh, healthy and positive relationships. Um, and so what we wanna do to practice this act of liberation and this, this act of, of healing um, is to sort of see what that would feel like. 
So what we want you to do is we want you to, to again, go back to your high five buddy, so the person that, that you um, have been talking with a lot about your sociogram. And what we want you to do is identify one person on your sociogram that you would like to have a healing conversation with. Um, and so, like I said, that could be somebody that um, you know, you've had a tentious or challenging relationship with and you want to talk to them about some challenging things. Um, or it could be somebody that has had a really significant and positive impact on your life and you want to tell them that they have had that positive impact and that you, you're grateful for that and that you want to continue that in the future. Um, so Ariel and I will uh, kind of demonstrate and we'll kind of role, role play and, and show you that a little what that will look like. So I'm going to act as if Ariel is my dad. Um, so my dad and I, we've got a little bit of a, not a, I wouldn't say a tentious relationship, but my folks got divorced when, um, when I was young. And um, that process of the divorce, it really shaped who I am today. And I've never really talked to him about, about that. I've never really talked to him about what that's meant for me. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to Ariel as if she's my dad, and I'm going to have this healing conversation with her. So, hey dad, I know that we don't normally talk about anything besides like baseball or you know, going up to the cabin um, and going fishing, but um, I really want to talk a little bit today about um, the divorce and, and the impact that it had on me. Um, you know, I think watching you cheat on mom and the impact that had on her and our family, um, it really showed me the kind of man that I don't want to be. Um, and the path that I don't want to take for my life. Um, and so it's a little scary to talk about this stuff. Um, but I know that you know, you're, you're a good dad, um, and I love you, and I know that you love me. Um, and in order for us to have a relationship where um, you know, we have honesty with each other and we can really be authentic and genuine with each other, um, that, that we really need to talk about this stuff. Um, so is that OK that we talk about that today? So that's one role model, one role play. Um, I'm going to role play uh, talking to one of my best friends. She was a bridesmaid in my wedding. Um, we've known each other since college. And the healing conversation that I want to have with her is expressing gratitude for the ways in which she's supported me um, in our relationship. So her name is Roxy. Kyle will be Roxy. <laughs> um, Roxy, oh my gosh, I, um, I have valued your friendship in so many different ways. Um, just this summer, standing next to you on your wedding day has meant so much. Um, but I know I've never really taken the time to tell you exactly why your friendship has meant so much to me, because it feels kind of awkward and cumbersome. Um, but I want to try to do that. Um, so you have been an incredible friend to me because you have listened so unconditionally and been so loving as a friend. You're incredibly patient and empathetic. And I think most of all, um, your faith and the way that you have offered prayer um, to support me in really difficult parts of my life has meant so much. So I'm so grateful for that. Um, and I look forward to all the ways in which our relationship and friendship will can continue to grow um, in the future. So thanks, friend. So what we're going to ask you to do is to go to your high five buddy and to identify someone on your worksheet that you want to have a healing relationship with. And then role play it. Um, it's going to probably be a little awkward, right? Because Kyle's not actually Roxy, and I'm not actually Kyle's dad. So, you know, we recognize the limitations that come with role playing. But we also know that having these conversations goes back to that, like, stomach dropping out, floor isn't there anymore kind of feeling. And we think that if we give you a space to practice it, even just once, that might start to build some of your comfort and ability to actually initiate these conversations in your real life. So find your high five buddy. You'll each role play one conversation where you want to have a healing, a healing conversation with one relationship. Again, it can be a relationship that has experienced some challenge or a relationship where you're just expressing gratitude. It's really amazing conversations going on. Um, we, we hate to cut those short, but we do have a limited amount of time. And we know that these, these conversations can, can and should continue on. Right. The point of, of practicing this stuff is to hopefully, maybe someday, transfer it to our real life where, where we might have a conversation um, like this in real life. We know that it's scary. There's that whoosh feeling, right, when we think about having these types of conversations, which <coughs> tends to be the reason why we push it to the back of our mind and say, like, oh, yeah, maybe, you know, maybe I'll talk to Dad about that one day. Um, but i got to get back to work. i got to, you know, get back to my stuff. Um, so we busy ourselves with, with ways to distract that stuff. And it's for good reason, because it's scary. But the more we practice it, the more we think about it, the easier it can be. So thank you um, for sharing some of that stuff.
Um, now, we've covered a ton of ground today. We've gone through vulnerability, identity, trust, authorship, and finally liberation. And normally, we could spend an hour at least on any one of those topics. And so we've, we've really sped, sped through them. And so we're hopeful that over the course of the next couple of days, um, these principles will sort of be the foundation for where we go from here and the conversations that we have from here. And hopefully, we were able to take the conversation sort of right off the bat to a, a level that um, can really start us off at, at a deep place. So um, uh, what we want to do to kind of close our time with you today um, is we want to have you set an intention. Uh, so this is something, again, going back to yoga practice um, that happens a lot in yoga practice. So you start um, your, your yoga session and, and the instructor will say, you know, we want you to create an intention for your practice. Um, so we want you to do the same today as we're ending. We want you to create an intention for incorporating vital practice into your life. Um, so it can be anything from um, trying to have that, that conversation with the, the person that you, um, th that you want to thank or that you've had a tenuous relationship with. Or maybe it's just um, you know, being brave and being vulnerable and talking to your family about this simple living stuff and what that's going to look like for you. Um, you know, just making an intention of, of how you want to incorporate the aspects of the vital practice model into your life. Now, once you make that intention, we want you to think, make a promise to yourself and think of one way that you can make progress towards that intention today. So one thing that you can practically do today to make that intention happen over the long term. So an example, in light of being at a conference and networking and relationship building, an intention that I might have is that I want to purposefully connect with someone here, so network, relationship build, but story share. But I really want to kind of practice some of this vulnerability. I want to go back to identity. And so my intention is that I want to network around stories and identity. So a step that I could tangibly take today is to say, would you sit and have coffee with me and tell me about who you are, not just what you do? So that's something that I could do today to work towards my intention of relationship building around stories and identity, not just about our professions or the other small talk that kind of comes up a lot of the time. Okay? So take a couple of minutes, maybe a minute, actually. Yep. Uh, <laughs> a minute. You got one a minute. minute. To think about it. And if it comes to you and you want to write something down, feel free. If this is kind of abstract and you're processing through a lot, just you know, ruminate on this. But what is something that you want to do? What's your intention for integrating vital practice into your life? And what's one thing you can do today towards that? Can you just really quickly say what all the steps are again? Yeah, absolutely. Do you want to go back to vulnerability, identity, trust, trust in the process, authorship, and operation? <laughs> so we want to thank you for your time and for kind of journeying and moving around the room and experiencing and talking with so many different people here. Um, we really hope that this vital practice model will help you cultivate more meaningful connections and that those connections will flourish into healthier relationships and that those relationships will support you to live a simpler life. Um, we have, you know, two and a half minutes for questions, um, but we also are very, very um, open and willing to connect with people throughout the rest of the conference. Kyle will be here the next two days. Um, and um, or on social media or you know with technology these days Skype um, Google Hangout whatever um, we also would love to encourage you to um, use the the vital practice hashtag and and tweet as, if you're on Twitter a takeaway or a lesson learned something that really resonated with you um, so that we can kind of look back and, and figure out you know what works in this um, and if there are questions um, you know what can we help people continue to think about um, as they're moving their vital practice forward. So I don't know if there are any questions. Well, oh, I want to thank you. This has been amazing. I'm just hoping that there were other people that cried during the conversation. <laughs> I did. I did. That was amazing. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for sharing that and being willing to be vulnerable. Yeah. Because I think we both view in the work that we do that crying is not a place of discomfort. That's actually a place of courage, mm -hmm. right? Because that is allowing your real emotions, whatever you're going through, to, to show up in the space. So, so the crying group goes over good. <laughs> <laughs> and for, for, the, for the men in the group too, like feel happy, feel, feel happy and free to go over there too because you know again, like I talk about masculinity a lot and what it means to be a man. And for me, like being a strong and brave man means being able to, to cry and share my emotions about who I am. So um, feel free to do that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you talk about healthy relationships. Um, what about there's someone that's just really unhealthy in your life, and but you're trying hard. I mean. 
do, is there a point where you kind of cut the ties? <coughs> but that's part of simplifying for me is mm -hmm. unhealthy relationships even. So do you guys encourage that as well, or do you have? Maybe it's another conversation. Yeah, yeah, so we actually, we had thought about talking about that today, um, but we know that that is a really sensitive thing for people, yeah. right? Like, just because you have a challenging relationship um, doesn't necessarily mean people want those people out of their life. Sometimes right. it does mean that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it means letting those people be away from you for a while, but not severing the ties completely. Um, and some, you know, sometimes that's what people need to heal instead of having that healing conversation. Sometimes the healing conversation can only happen so many times, you know, until you need to separate and just heal on your own. Um, but, you know, I think that's one of those things that, that it's individual case by case and you really have to be able to determine for yourself where that relationship is at. I think something that's helped me in terms of perspective is I used to believe that every relationship or close connection that I made would stay with me for the rest of my life. I just assumed that that's how it worked. Um, and I think when I was able to integrate this perspective that sometimes relationships are situational or time sensitive. It's about a phase or a geographic location. And then to know that relationships grow and sometimes that means growing apart to accept that for me has allowed me to engage in relationships more simply. Because instead of desperately holding on to relationships, some of which have turned to be toxic just because we've grown into different people, mm -hmm. I have kind of given myself permission to let go in some of those spaces. Um, you know, not that is not an easy decision ever. No, I think it's a great framework or a uh, frame of mind to think about. Because yeah. one of my things is like permission. Mm -hmm. You can do certain things that you don't think you can, but um, no, it was great. Totally. Of course. Yeah. 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 So we want to be respectful of time, so thank you again. Yeah.